Hello, my name is Chris Clark. I'm the Artistic Director of Cinema St. Louis, and we're the proud presenters of year three, or is it four, I can't remember, of our Golden Anniversaries uh, film series, which is uh, discussions uh, monthly, uh, 11 months of the year, excluding the month of November when we hold the St. Louis International Film Festival. And these are films that are golden because they're 50 years old. Um, in the far off year of 1971, I was nine for most of the year and, and 10 for a couple months at the end of the year, I was born in September. And I was always aware of the character of Dirty Harry, but you know, I don't really remember if I saw this film. I know it was a big drive-in fair and uh, very popular uh, at the time. Uh, this series uh, <clears throat> is co-sponsored by friends at St. Louis Public Library. Um, the discussions, which we're hosting live uh, Mondays once a month, are also archived on our Cinema St. Louis Golden Anniversaries YouTube channel, uh, where you can watch it at any time. Uh, you won't be watching the movie as part of this, as most of you know, um, we'll assume that you've already seen it or are very well, very well aware of the films um, being discussed. Uh, next month, we will have a, a discussion of the film Clute um, in October. I'm looking forward to being host once again uh, for a lively discussion with uh, Kathy Corley uh, about Harold and Maude. And we'll conclude this year in December uh, with the Werner Herzog film, uh, Fata Morgana. Um, tonight we have uh, Diane Carson, longtime friend of Cinema St. Louis, passionate film lover, uh, passionate film discussant and reviewer, uh, has been on thousands of juries for us over time, uh, former film instructor, uh, radio reviewer, has done lots of stuff, horse lover, I'll throw that in there. Um, <clears throat> uh, has agreed to um, talk and uh, there's, you know, the. Cliff, our executive director, Cliff Freilich, um, dutifully makes a list of dozens of viable possibilities and discusses the choices with potential uh, discussants like Diane. And Diane very much wanted to talk about this film, but in her own voice, in her own uh, vision of what she feels its import and place was in 1971 and in film history. Um, when we discuss these films, these are not necessarily always positive points of view, um, but it's, you know, this is an iconic piece of film history. Uh, so it was a very important part of 1971 and earned its spot among the 11 uh, we're doing this year. Uh, my role is sort of the game show host. I'm here to announce uh, the, the setting and the place and time. Uh, Diane's gonna take over from here. Um, I will return later. Um, questions and comments, please post them into the chat function um, on Eventive and they will be dutifully recorded. I will then relay them to Diane uh, after her uh, talk and then I'll have a few questions on my own uh, after that. So I'm going to disappear off into the electronic mist and you'll, um, Diane, you take over from here. Thank you very much, Ms. Carson. Oh, you are welcome, Chris. Another film lover. I have to say, since he mentioned that I'm also a horse lover, my horse's name is Cool Hand Luke. So uh, it has uh, invaded every aspect of my life. Uh, I am going to be going to uh, screen sharing uh, of a PowerPoint that I put together and working through a couple dozen slides that probably will raise some comments, issues that uh, those of you who are here live will want, I hope, will want to pursue. So let me go to that and hope that, whoops, I got to go to my screen sharing first. Okay. The desktop, and then I'm going to go to the presenter view and hope that this works. Um, if, if this does not just show the slide, Chris, just let me know on my screen, all I'm seeing is the slide, which is which is- You are, you are golden, like a golden anniversary. Oh, perfect. We're in, we are in sync with the film. Okay. Um, first, just some, some background things. Of course, this was made in 1971, as Chris said, director Don Siegel, starring Clint Eastwood, who also did direct the jumper scene in the film that we will get to. 
Um, a couple of times I have heard commentaries that this was his, this was the first thing he ever directed, which I, I don't think that's right because he was also directing Play Misty for me, his first directorial film uh, at the same time and Play Misty for me even opened before, about a month before Dirty Harry. So I don't know, that's kind of up in the air, but he did direct the jumper scene because Don Siegel was, was uh, sick that night. And in his uh, continuing style, he came in under what they had estimated. They had the, the studio had estimated that this would take six days to shoot the jumper scene. And he did it in one night, went into about three o'clock the next morning, but he wrapped it up then and was very proud of himself. Okay, just a little bit. I'm not going to go much into the history of Clint Eastwood because we would be here until after midnight, I'm sure. All of you know of his sterling and long career, but he was born just to give a few details of the earlier days. He was born in 1930, and I first remember seeing him in Rawhide, which was really his breakthrough role, television series. Um, Unforgiven is, uh, it was done in 1992, so I'm jumping way ahead there. But what I wanted to include was that his dedication for that film was for Don and Sergio. And of course, the Don there is Don Siegel. He learned a lot from Don Siegel and was always very grateful to him for, for the way he taught him how efficient to be making a film. And of course, Sergio is Sergio Leone. Um, I just had to put this in about Unforgiven because it did win Best Picture, Director, Supporting Actor for Hackman, and Best Film Editing. But the important thing is that he, he dedicated it to Sergio Leone and Don Siegel. Um, he really became well known, and most of you probably know this, as the man with no name for Sergio Leone for the trilogy of A Fistful of Dollars, for a few dollars more, and The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And these were all made, as you see, before the Dirty Harry sequence or series. And that series included five films. This was the first. I'm gonna focus on this one, though there are a lot of changes and a lot of developments in the next four. Magnum Force, The Enforcer, Sudden Impact, and The Deadpool. And I had thought until I rewatched Dirty Harry that Go Ahead, Make My Day was actually in Dirty Harry, but that, act, that line is actually in Sudden Impact, which was the one of the five that Clint Eastwood directed. Okay, I'm gonna move into a little bit on the technical and the aesthetic details, and then we'll get to the real issues with the film. Um, there are many, if you have rewatched this film, I'm sure you saw there are a lot of dark scenes accentuated by neon lights. And the cinematographer, Bruce Surtees, whose father was also a cinematographer, was well known for being able to shoot dark scenes. And that was, they decided that that was exactly the kind of compliment to the tone of the film that they wanted. So a lot of, lot of dark scenes. Sometimes you're almost squinting to see what's going on. A lot of long and wide shots punctuated with very effective close-ups. So when the close-ups come, they truly have maximum impact because they're, they're, they're not used um, too generously. They're used sparingly and for good effect. The editing is very unintrusive. In other words, it really doesn't call attention to itself, which means it's very effective. Usually editors will say, if you notice my editing, I know I'm not doing it right because it should be invisible. Um, Carl Pingatori is the one who did the editing, the art direction, <clears throat> excuse me, Dale Hennessy, and the music by Lalo Schifrin, uh, he also had worked several times with Don Siegel and uh, Eastwood, who, as I'm sure you all know, is a huge jazz lover. And in fact, Eastwood actually, when he went to college, majored in music. He loved jazz. He loved Schifrin's ability to use a very jazzy and powerful score in order to make points. And so I think in this film, the music doesn't really stay in the background. I think when it's used, you notice it, but not in a bad way. I think you notice 
how nicely, how effectively, how powerfully it interprets the mood and attitude of the scene. The screenplay was written by three people, Harry Julian Fink, Ruta M. Fink, and Dean Reisner. Uncredited, to my surprise, when I was, was looking for more information on this, researching this, is Terry Malick, also worked on an earlier version of it. It went through about five, six rewrites, and John Milius. The story came from the Finks and then uncredited Joe Himes. There are a lot of, I'm gonna get this out of the way, because there are a lot of times when people say that there are many similarities between this and High Noon, which was made in 1952, because of Gary Cooper at the end of the film, taking his badge and throwing it into the dirt. The difference is in the politics of those two films are as diametrically opposed as they could possibly be. So there is a similarity in what happens, but there is no similarity in what it means. For Fred Zinnemann and of course, Carl Foreman, who had been one of the people who was blacklisted in the 50s, this was High Noon is a film about McCarthyism and people not standing up for what they believe in. And in this case, Gary Cooper is upholding the law and he is disappointed in the community. It's not that he is contemptuous of his, of his adherence to law and order. So there is a similar action, but a very different political context. There are some scenes in this film that are reminiscent of other scenes at the same time, or not other scenes at the same time, other films that were around the same time. For example, Bullets Car Scene, 1968, which is three years before this, also of course shot in San Francisco. There are a couple of times when in, in uh, Dirty Harry, car comes up over uh, a hillside up or over one of the steep streets. And I even kind of flashed back to, to Bullet. Um, later, it had a dramatic influence on Taxi Driver because of the darkness and because of the neon that was used in so many of the scenes that uh, Marty Scorsese used for Taxi Driver. And even some of the, some of the comments sound very much like the cynicism of Harry Callahan. On acting, this is a quote from Clint Eastwood. He said, you have to portray characters as honestly as you can. Even liars think they're right. The antagonist thinks he's right. The story should be like real life. So make as honest a character as possible about Harry Callahan's personality. And this really is a credit to Clint Eastwood's acting. Um, I think for all of the other negative things that I will say about the film, I think that as a technical achievement and as an acting performance, it is absolutely superb. And it's unusual in some ways. Harry Callahan's personality, he's very soft-spoken. I mean, he almost purrs at times. He has a velvety voice. He is calm. He never yells, though he becomes increasingly angry. And of course, he's quite sarcastic from the very beginning to the end. He is, of course, very prejudiced. That's his reputation. Uh, but he winks when he says, especially Spicks, after a litany of ethnic insults have been reeled off by the uh, policeman that he calls Fatso, who actually, as a little trivia, uh, was Robert Mitchum's brother. But um, after they, they reel off that litany of, of ethnic insults that, you know, he hates everybody, uh, he kind of winks after he says that. And... On the positive, he wants to keep Chico Gonzalez as his partner, Rennie Santoni, wants to keep him as his partner because he has proved his mettle uh, on more than one occasion as, as his partner. Uh, to his credit, Harry says when he's talking to Chico's wife that he understands his wife's fear regarding a cop's life in danger. Uh, when he says uh, that he's, you know, wanted to partner with him and she says, you know, she, she doesn't want that 
how does your wife deal with it? And of course he has to say, well, she's dead. On Harry Callahan, Eastwood said, I wanted to play it with an economy of words and create this whole feeling through attitude and movement. It was just the kind of character I had envisioned for a long time. Keep to the mystery and allude to what happened in the past. You know, they don't ever really spell it out. It came about after the frustration of doing Rawhide for so long. I felt the less he said, he being Harry, the stronger he became and the more he grew in the imagination of the audience. And I think this really very nicely describes how he approached the character. I mean, he really got into what I should be doing, how I should be doing it. And you will see that I think very powerfully in the clips that we look at. Now we're gonna get into the themes and issues. And there I have more to say about these, which is why I saved them until after some of the basic technical things and Eastwood's comments about acting. The racism in the film is evident in the bank robbery scene, which we're going to look at. The man who is paid to beat up Scorpio is a black man. I kind of feel like um, Humphrey Bogart at the end of, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, when he says, on the one hand, Maltese Falcon, on the one hand, you know, he lists all the negative things about Mary Astor. And then he says, well, on the positive, you know, on your side, well, on the positive side, the doctor that he goes to after the bank robbery scene is black. He is a friend from the neighborhood. And that's, that surprised me. That was unusual. There is a very telling comment I mean, they came from the same neighborhood, they're friends. He calls him Steve, doesn't call him Dr. So-and-so. But he the doctor does say to him when Harry says, you know, don't do anything special, just a little mercurochrome, et cetera. And the doctor says, don't tell me how to do my job. I don't tell you how to beat confessions out of your suspects. So he has a reputation that has preceded everything that happens in this film. Scorpio wants to kill a priest and a Negro, he says, and he does. Um, religion is interesting in this film, and I'm still kind of working out some of the scenes with it. In fact, the first word that Harry says when he shows up at the, at the original killing, the first word he says is, Jesus. And it goes on from there. Um, the neon sign Jesus saves is completely shot up in the confrontation between Scorpio and Harry. And I was kind of laughing at that because as they're shooting the sign, I'm thinking um, the sign says Jesus saves, but it obviously isn't. And there are several times when religion comes up in the course of the film. Um, Scorpio in Kazar Stadium is when he's lying on the field, it is, there's very, very clearly a white cross in the chalk lines behind him on the field. Uh, this is the scene where Harry is torturing him and, and beating him up. There is some mild homophobia. There isn't a lot of it, but of course this is San Francisco. And so they have to include this scene, it seems, of the stereotype young gay man who propositions Harry at, at Aquatic Park. Um, all of these things I say to myself, was this really necessary? What did this add? Uh, and so I think you come down on the side of there is some real racism here, there's some real homophobia, and there certainly is some sexism. There is casual and unnecessary nudity. The woman in the apartment that you almost think that uh, Harry is being a peeping Tom. There is the strip club, and there is the dead girl who, when she, who is when she is taken out of the hole in the ground, is completely nude facing the camera. And Harry's comment in the red light district is kind of reminiscent of a taxi driver as well. He said, these loonies ought to throw a net over the whole bunch of them, which is kind of interesting versus his peeping Tom scene. 
Okay, Harry Callahan in the bank robbery scene really establishes his character when he faces off with the robber, robber with his Smith & Wesson Model 29 revolver, 44 Magnum cartridge. And incidentally, sales of this increased after the film. Um, often people talk about, well, it's just a film, you know, what difference can it make? And of course, if you study the influence that films have, you see over and over and over that they do impact sales, that they do impact uh, applications for me, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways, applications for journalism school sometimes after some of the, the films that focus on muckraking after all the president's men, for example. Uh, they're, they're very influential and have been for, for many, many years. Um, the story is that one of the, I think, most iconic stories is that after it happened one night in 1934, when Clark Gable took off his shirt and didn't have his, his formal shirt and didn't have a t-shirt on under it, t-shirt sales plummeted. And they didn't really recover until Marlon Brando posed in a t-shirt in the 1950s and suddenly everybody wanted a t-shirt again. Um, you know, it's not that the sales disappeared, but it had an impact. And that is what we have seen with films. And so when people say, well, it's just a movie, you're taking it too seriously. Um, if it impacts things explicitly that we can measure, it impacts things implicitly as well. And so I do take film seriously. Okay, now to the scene of the bank robbery. And this is, of course, after it has started and Harry is walking across the street towards the bank robber who is lying on his back. So um, Chris, I'm going to stop sharing and we can go to, this is a three minute clip of the bank robbery. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, to tell you the truth, in all this excitement, I've kind of lost track myself. But Ian, this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and would blow your head clean off. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk?
this. Okay, am I am I back sharing? I don't know. Uh, no, I think I need to go down here, go back here. Okay, I am I am screen sharing. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to. Okay, um, that is an incredibly well done scene and an incredibly racist scene. Let me jump ahead to this next. He is, I mean, you, you could just analyze every second of that scene to learn how to put together a really effective, powerful scene. Harry is walking so casually. First of all, he doesn't want to have to intervene. He's sitting have, having his hot dog and he's, wait, he's hoping the cavalry will arrive. But it also says something about how observant he is as a cop, what a good cop he is, because when he drives in, he sees the guy sitting there. He immediately assesses the situation and knows what's going on. I really don't think somebody would have smoked that many cigarettes waiting for a quick bank robbery, but that's okay. It works in terms of the plot quite well, but it just shows he quickly assesses the situation. He knows what's going on. He knows the guy at the, at the burger place. He's gonna have his usual hot dog that he has for, I guess, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So he's upset when he, when he hears the alarm, bank alarm going off, he heads out. Casually, he's walking across the street. He's still chewing his hot dog. Uh, and as he walks across the street, he's clearly in control. People around him are cringing and hiding, but not Harry, you know, he's in charge. He's, he has established his incredibly dominant presence, his character, his control of the whole situation. And as he walks up, oh, well, first of all, he you know, shoots everybody from a mile away to, to close up. And then as he walks up to the bank robber who he shot just coming out of the bank, these are the lines that he says that have become so iconic Though a lot of people misquote these lines, this is kind of like at the end of Casablanca, how often people misquote the lines. Most, many times I've heard people say, do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? But what he really says is exactly what's here. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? And of course, the punk is terrified. His name is Robert Popwell. Uh, he doesn't have a name in, he's just the bank robber. Um, he doesn't have a name in the film, but he is, the difference between how the two of them are shot, the camera low on Harry, looking up at him, total dominance, total control, as opposed to Robert Popwell, who is scrunched down on his back up against the side of the building. And even after he doesn't go for the gun and Harry starts to walk away, after smirking and even he will in a couple of seconds laugh at him after it turns out that he doesn't have another bullet. But what Popwell says is, I got to know. He doesn't even say, I've got to know. Um, I mean, it's, it's a totally unnecessary put down of the robber and the way he's presented is night and day, a dichotomy between Harry and between the black bank robber. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on from, from that. So maybe we can come back to that if some of you wanna talk more about uh, that scene because it's an, I say it's an incredibly well edited scene. It's an incredibly well shot scene. And Eastman's, I mean, Eastwood's acting in it is, is truly brilliant. I don't know how many, they probably didn't do that many takes of it because there's so much going on, but his presence, his deliberation, the expressions on his face, which are really micromanaged are superb. 
The other aspect of this film that really upset a lot of people, and we'll get to some of that, are the explicit, is the explicit attack on the legal rights of criminals. And these are explicitly referenced in the film. I mean, they don't go into the details, but the Escobedo case of 1964, which asserted the right to counsel during interrogation under the Sixth Amendment, the Miranda decision, which everybody does pretty much know about, the 1966 Supreme Court decision, which required an immediate warning of your rights, the Fourth Amendment, which protects from illegal search and seizure. And these are, of course, brought up when he's told that Scorpio is going to be released. And his comment, because all of his rights have been violated, and Harry's comment, and he's been sarcastic through the whole film, is, well, I'm all broken up about that man's rights. And that's, that's pretty much the attitude. He becomes like the frontier hero. He has to step outside of the law to make things right because our, quote, liberal society has gone too far to protecting the criminal. That criminal is Scorpio, who has a baby face and voice and mannerisms. Uh, his real name is Andy Robinson, and he is so despicable that of course we hate him and we're rooting for Harry. I mean, we're very, very finely manipulated, very delicately manipulated, and then a little hard, um, heavy handedly manipulated into wanting Harry to get this guy. He's despicable, he's weak, he's panicky, but he's a clever psychopath, but he's a coward. He's the deranged killer, he's sadistic. He is the embodiment of evil. Um, I like to give credit to people whose comments I have taken from other places, and this comes from a recent anthology uh, on Clint Eastwood called Tough Ain't Enough in an article by Jonathan Kirshner, uh, edited by Lester Friedman and, and David Desser. But you can just look at his face and you know how despicable he is, and especially because he takes children as hostages at the end. This, I mean, what is more iconic than the yellow school bus that he goes after at the end? And then in the final scene, grabbing the boy and hiding behind him. So he is about as low and as much an embodiment of evil as you can get. Um, you know, probably we, I should go back. Um, let's go ahead and play the clip about that, that focuses on the felon's rights and focuses on that. I will stop sharing my screen. So that's, that's where we are in terms of the explicit message of this film. And I think I throw up on a slide a little bit farther down that it's even significant, of course, that the judge teaches at UC Berkeley which of course everybody in the 60s knew was that bastion of liberalism, et cetera. And this is of course 1971 film. So that's, that's not incidental at all. Um, many of Eastwood's reaction shots I think are just superb. And you see those kind of micro reactions crossing his face during that exchange. And we really see it through the whole film. As I say, I, I think it's absolutely a brilliant performance by Eastwood. Okay, and then in the, in the final closing scene, there is a repetition of his earlier lines, but this time with a real menacing anger to it. You know, the first time it's, it's half funny and he's smirking and, after he pulls the trigger, it's even, you know, he even laughs about it. Um, but this time his, his anger when he faces Scorpio is um, exaggerated and intense. Okay, a couple of other things about the film in terms of issues. Um, of course, Harry resorts to torture and Eastwood says it was his idea it was shocking and brutal and unexpected and not sugar-coated, which it isn't. I mean, the camera, even after we see him torturing Scorpio in the Khazar Stadium, the camera just pulls way, 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 way back. Eastwood says most actors would not have done that, but he thought it fit the character. This was uh, quoted in Richard Schickel's bio of Eastwood. 
Um, I told you this line before, the black doctor, Steve, asks him, do I come down to the station and tell you how to beat a confession out of a prisoner after Harry says he just wants some mercurochrome and tweezers for his leg wound. Um, so again, what this establishes is this is Harry Callahan's approach, even though it's clear he is shocked when he hears the comments about Miranda and the Fourth Amendment and we're going to have to let him go, et cetera, let Scorpio go. Okay, a few critics' comments um, on the film. Ebert said the movie's, Roger Ebert said, the movie's moral position is fascist. There is no doubt about it. Kale said, a stunningly well-made genre piece, which it is, between hippie maniac and helplessly emasculated police force because of the laws that defend the, the um, aggrieved criminal's rights. Um, it was called the ultimate cop movie in Born to be Wild. And also in that book, A Champion of the Right, it, he undercuts, Harry undercuts the social order he purports to defend. The emphasis shifts from a righteous cause to the cop's daring do. He must operate outside the law to affect the justice that society has clearly forgotten how to administer. Dave Kerr wrote that Harry is equated visually and morally with the psychotic killer because he's trampling, as he's trampling the constitution to catch Scorpio. And there was controversy immediately after the release of the film, including outside the 44th Academy Awards that year where people held up signs saying, Dirty Harry is a rotten pig of course, pig being used at that time um, to identify cops. So the, the reaction to the film was, was immediate, even though both um, Harry, or, um, Eastwood and Siegel said, no, 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 we, we never meant that. The location for shooting the film was purposely moved from New York to San Francisco because San Francisco was the, was the heart of counterculture. They had considered Seattle, um, but they decided on San Francisco. They, they really abandoned New York because they had already shot a couple of cop films there and they said, it's just been done too many times. I mentioned about the judge teaching at the liberal UC Berkeley, the appellate judge. Um, a few other just details about the film. There certainly is some voyeurism in this film, which with a nod to Rear Window, which was made in 1954, um, as well as several other scenes, like the Peeping Tom scene. Uh, and about the casting, Paul Newman, Burt Lancaster, Robert Mitchum all rejected the role as an, as an inherently unsavory character. Uh, Steve McQueen turned it down. George C. Scott said that it was too violent in his or an a biography of him. Sinatra was supposed to play Harry Callahan. He was pretty much signed on to do it, but he hurt his arm or his hand and, and he couldn't do it. And actually it was Paul Newman who suggested that Clint Eastwood, 40, 41 years old at the time, uh, would be perfect for the role. And a few other incidentals, which I find kind of amazing about this. You can get Dirty Harry posters. You can get Dirty Harry wallpaper. There is a pinball game of Dirty Harry. Nixon screened the film and liked it so much, he appointed Clint Eastwood to a six-year term on the National Council for the Arts. The box office was 36 million, the fourth highest for 1971. So it was immediately popular which is a pretty good return on a $4 million production budget. In 2021, I'm sorry, not 2021, I think I, I reversed those numbers, it was 2012. The film was selected for the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant, which it certainly is. I mean, it influenced the, the police procedural genre and the representation of the strong cop um, from then on, the original draft, in the original draft of the screenplay, Scorpio was shot by police or Marine snipers, not by Harry Callahan. 
And the villain was called Travis. I don't know if Martin Scorsese, Scorsese knew that when he named his guy Travis Pickle or not. East, Eastwood reportedly said that having Scorpio shot by the police or, or Marine snipers throws away the whole point of the story, which is the cop chasing down the killer. Scorpio was loosely based on the Zodiac serial killer in, San, in the San Francisco area uh, who had committed five murders. And John Milius, who, as you know, worked on the script, said, you could see what he contributed, as he said, lots of guns. Um, and he even said the cop should be the same as the killer, except with a badge. And he referenced Kurosawa's 1945, Akira Kurosawa, the great Japanese director's director, his 1949 movie, Stray Dog, in which the policeman is also uh, fairly out, out of the norm in terms of what he does. In terms of Scorpio, Audie Murphy was, continue, was considered, but he died in a plane crash before the film was in, even into production. And James Kahn was considered for Scorpio. Eastwood had seen Robinson in a stage play and said that he was perfect. <laughs> I don't know how Robinson would react to this, but that he just looked perfect as a psychologically unbalanced hippie. I guess that was a credit to whatever he was doing in that stage play. Um, Siegel said he wanted a killer with a face like a choir boy. Robinson himself, who was a total pacifist, pacifist hated the violence and had to learn how to shoot a gun. And finally, um, this film has been influential, um, but it also has been, future, I should say future work, um, influenced Don Siegel. And among them was Nellie Kaplan's A Very Curious Girl, a 1969 film with the UK title of Dirty Mary. Siegel told Kaplan that she inspired him. And so she had an influence on him and vice versa. The supernatural quality and tone of Kaplan's female lead influenced the strong women in atmosphere of The Beguiled, which came later. And I have to thank Tina Louise Reed for her encyclopedic knowledge of all things cinematic. Um, unfortunately, I have to add that Ka Kaplan died last year of COVID complications, which is really a shame at 89 years old. Her films, if you're interested in those, explored strong women characters. And I think one of the best is the 1976 Nea and 1979 Charles and Lucy. Okay, those are, and then finally on Don Siegel, um, because he was the one I was speaking of with the mutual influence uh, with Nellie Kaplan and very influenced in very positive ways by her. Um, he directed the opening montage in Casablanca, 1941. I mean, he was somebody who was well known, uh, was really a, a craftsman who could go in and shoot just about anything and do a good job of it, which is one of the reasons Eastwood loved having him as a mentor and appreciated what he learned from him. He, for example, did the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 1956, which is a great film. And Steve McQueen, he directed in Hell is for Heroes, 62. Lee Marvin in The Killers in 64. And then Coogan's Bluff, 1968, when he and Eastwood really became well known and Two Mules for Sister Sarah and The Beguiled. So they worked on four films together before Eastwood started doing uh, most of his own directing later in his career. Okay, that is the end of my, I think I guess I should stop screen share. Um, those are the end of my slides and I've raised a lot of issues and we still have some time. So I'm hoping that some of you who are in attendance as opposed to watching this once it's recorded and, and or as it's recorded and posted, um, have some comments or observations or objections or whatever. Well, before that happens, Breeze and the, the, the woman behind the curtains tonight and she'll be forwarding questions to me and I'll forward them to you. But um, I have some questions and, and comments of my own too. You touched around some of it, you know, but initially, you know, who, is part of the 
I don't want to use the word toxic, but the depictions of masculinity, especially in cop characters during the 70s, was always the hard boiled, stone faced rebel. Um, he at least had a very clean aesthetic to his, to his dress. Usually they're more slovenly, um, but he was very clean and neat. But the, the scene that we showed, the first scene we showed uh, with him torture, you know, taunting the guy with a gun, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's legal. Um, and he laughed. The only really time you see him crack a smile yes. was when he got, got over on this, this poor guy. Um, I want to skip, you know, and then, you know, so, you know, this whole performance and that's the whole thing that's Carrie Hallahan is this, Kind of telescoping to his future politics and and the way he feels about you know crime in America and punishment, um, it seems like he was sort of you know sort of boiling the soup um, to get it ready for later. I I think he's already there. I mean, you can you know of course again the sixties you know is the decade of protest against the Vietnam War and. Then, you know, the Escobedo, the Miranda, you know, the, the criminals' rights uh, assertions by the Supreme Court, et cetera. And I, I, think, I think you already see it there. It's, it's the genesis or else it's already formed in terms of, you know, what, in terms of his politics, in terms of what he's presenting there. And their disclaimer as to, well, you know, we didn't we didn't really mean any of these things. It, the kind of it's just a movie, which is why I said those things about it. it's never just a movie. You know, the politics and the things, the values that are represented. And you're absolutely right. I mean, his interaction with the bank robber is sadistic. I mean, it's absolutely he taunts him. He smirks. He starts to turn and walk away. He comes back. And then after he pulls the trigger. There isn't a, he, you're right, it's the only time we see him laugh in the whole movie. Yes. Um, I, and I, you know, I was looking at things in the background as I noticed early, you know, in, in that same scene, um, all the painters on the scaffolding were also black. Um, I don't know what, you know, that meant, but it sort of, you know, followed the pattern that you underscored that people had certain roles you know, ethnically and in societally, you know, in, in the storytelling. Um, and because they were in San Francisco, I think he felt compelled to show, to represent hippie old culture by showing the queer man in the park. And something that I caught um, is the first, he didn't ultimately get shot, but the black man in the purple poncho eating ice cream with his friend. Uh, I got a clearly queer vibe from that man. So that would have been a double for him um, if he would have shot and, you know, and right. So they keep, you know, they had to, it seemed like the filmmaker and the storytelling had to include characters like that, that were flamboyant and caricatures to set, you know, like, like they didn't have the arch. They didn't show the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge all that much, but they had to show something there in San Francisco. So they had to show uh, gay people. And, and on that same vein, I got a weird kind of repressed gay vibe from Scorpio. Oh, absolutely. The baby face thing. So I got this repressed hatred for him. Uh, if it would have been James Caan, it would not have been the same character. I think they deliberately looked for this person was faulty wiring. Um, so he, you know, he was going to be automatically a bad person. Yep, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I forgot to mention the two guys that come out. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, second, the second one that uh, Scorpio wants to shoot. And yes. then he kisses them. And then he I, I also thought of the conversation you know, with people moving through the park and hearing them and not hearing them and finding them and not finding them. Um, but they're, they're definitely relying on caricature, stereotypes, which is why they put it in San Francisco. And there were a lot of people in San Francisco who said they really hated how San Francisco was depicted because it made the city, you know, not necessarily the characters, but the city look so ugly. Well, that, you know, uh, like you, you mentioned Bullet and there are other, um, I don't know if you remember the, the goof that was foul play 
the Chevy Chase movie, there was lots of chase scenes up and down uh, the hills there. So <clears throat> the streets of San Francisco became kind of crime characters of their of their own, just to, so people could see cars and people and things bouncing up and down down the hill. So it made it look grittier and dirt, far dirtier than it really is uh, for for those kind of things. Um, I want to flash forward to the very end. Yeah. So, you know, looking at his badge, disgusted with the world and, you know, the, the law is crazy and all that. Then he takes his badge out because he's better than all that. And he throws it into the water and walks away, which in and of itself is a perfect ending. But then over the next 17 years, there's four more sequels. <laughs> so does that inherently ruin ruin what he's done there by trying to you know make a clue of this character and then revives it like he's freddy krueger and keeps coming back I, they must have explained how he you know went and got another badge and went back to work or they talked him out of it but that seemed like that character's mind that seemed like there was an act of finality that that should have been the end but you know money, money talks i guess yeah he said he never intended to do any sequels to this but because, you know, the money they made off of it and the character, I mean, it, was, it became so iconic to so many people. And even though I disagree with every moment of the politics of it, I'm sitting watching it thinking, yeah, go Harry. I mean, it just manipulates you into this. We need a savior. We, I mean, because Scorpio is so despicable. I mean, I don't know what else he could have done that would have been worse except maybe shoot a dog. I mean, that would have been about the only other thing he could have done that would have been nastier. Um, and I remember being shocked at the scene where he play, he pays the black guy to beat him up. And when you think about it, all of the bad people in this film, except for Scorpio, are black people. Every one of the bank robbers is black. The guy who beats him up is black, except for the doctor. He's the only one who is not in, and, and I'd love to know the story of that, but he's the only one who's not in that stereotypical role. And I noticed that too about the workers who were during the bank robbery scene who are on the scaffolding that, that yeah, they're, they're all black. And there are some black people cringing in the background, but there are white people cringing in the background too, which again, just exaggerates his magnanimity and his control and you know, his greatness because other people are also frightened and they're cringing and he's just boldly walking, you know, not even boldly, really casually walking across the street, so. And I was terrified in a way by your factoid, how much Richard Nixon of all people loved the character and then put him on, I remember him being on the National Council for the Arts. I do remember that. I never really understood why he was not, you yeah. know, I guess he is an artist of himself, but it seemed like a more liberal leaning post uh, that he took, but he was, you know, uh, a fellow right-wing Republican saw something in him that he admired and it sort of, you know, engendered permission for that culture to perpetuate. Yes. Yeah. He had invited, after he saw it, he invited him to the White House and then appointed him to, I guess he invited him to say, you know, will you do this if I appoint you? And Clint Eastwood said, yes, he would. So he did. Um, I'm going to dip my toes into the warm waters of questions and comments. We have a series of comments and questions from one of our viewers named Morgan. Hello, Morgan. Uh, first, um, <clears throat> how does one become a film reviewer at KDHX? That is <laughs> completely unrelated to what we're talking about, but uh, you have a, a fan base here that are follow that. So we'll we'll get to that another way. So there's gotta be a path or uh, anyway. Um, but um, <clears throat> Morgan makes a comment. We, we talked about uh, Andy Robinson and uh, that he was in a, also she mentions that he was in a mental hospital as a child and felt very weird playing that character. And then he, you know, he said he was in the theater so and everything too. So, you know, that, that leads me to believe he was, it was typecast. And I don't know what play he was in. Was it hair? You know, what was Clint Eastwood watching him in a theater in San Francisco? You know, how did he pick this guy out uh, and finds it? Um, yeah. Morgan also makes a comment about the dialogue of the black man laying on the sidewalk in that early scene that got to know, you know, maybe that was improvised, you know, maybe that wasn't literally written into the script, but the fact that it was used 
Yeah, I mean, even if it illustrates your point, they could have said, oh, no, that's not in the script. And that, you know, I, you know, that's colloquial usage uh, of, of the words, but, you know, it was a choice. It was certainly was a choice. And, you know, they always could have gone back and said, no, 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 don't say that. Say, I've got to know, or I want to know, or, I mean, you know, there's somebody there directing this. And as you say, they're, they're, even if he did improvise it, he, they're making that choice, which just diminishes him even more. I mean, he's not even using standard English. Yes. It puts him in an even more subservient, inferior condition and and it's insulting it's racist because he is black and there he is lying there and it, it's also just the whole thing with the way his body is scrunched up you know and his head is down he looks so uncomfortable and then there's the camera looking up on clinton looking at the supposedly one line that was improvised is when he fights scorpio and uh, clint eastwood takes the gun out and he says Oh, that sure is a big one, or that that's that's certainly a nice big one. Supposedly, Scorpio did, or Robinson did improvise that line, and the and the whole crew broke up so much they had to reshoot it because they couldn't use his improvising of it. <laughs> uh, we have another comment from Wink, um, who sees the film as a continuation or throwback uh, to film noir from the forties and fifties. You know, the hard-boiled detective becomes the lone loner cop, the dark lighting, the hard one justice, good versus evil, classic noir. Um, <clears throat> you know, you kind of touched on that uh, a little bit, you know, all the way, but different than film noir, you know, the seventies, you know, Ooh. bad boy. Hello, Penny, the dog. Hello. I'm talking right now. Daddy's busy. Why don't you go, go somewhere else? Uh, <clears throat> It, they take it, you know, they take it an extra notch. There was, they were less good to them. They were, they were more jaded. They were darker. Uh, times were darker. Um, their outlook were darker. Um, you know, like in uh, a taxi driver, you know, this, you know, washing the scum and villainy, you know, and off the, they really, it wasn't good versus evil. The, the questionable mental health of Harry Callahan really, really, truly looked down on these people are scum and didn't he look down on his superiors did what he wanted in all situations so you know made himself king uh, made his own set of of rules um so it's different than film noir it was and he's contemptuous from the very beginning when he's first called in i mean before any of that happens when he's first called in to the office and he says what have you been doing and he says i've been sitting on my ass for 45 minutes waiting for you I mean, you know, he's got this contemptuous attitude from the get go, you know, before all of the other stuff unfolds. Um, and uh, he is, he tortures the guy. I mean, he, yeah, he, he goes over the line. He's not just trying to reestablish law and order. He's contemptuous of what law and order means. And as I said, I mean, I was kind of shocked rewatching it this time, how explicitly they go after Escobedo, Miranda, the Fourth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment. I mean, there, there isn't any question about how they're going after that. It's not like I need to adjust things and we'll be back on the straight and narrow. It's like, no, this is just all a big mistake. This has gotten out of control. You know, I'm so broken up about his rights and I'm just not going to pay any attention to it anymore. Yeah, the, the white male savior is above the law and becomes the law and everyone else below him and even those above him who are in his mind below him also um don't matter you know he is in essence you know infallible you yeah, know is he the is he the pope um pope callahan uh, you know in his mind he is you know the, the end the end to justice and then when justice isn't served he throws his badge away until he makes four more films over the next 20 years so you know that and they take up some interesting. interesting issues in those too, because of course in the next one, Tyne Daly becomes his partner. And so he's contemptuous of her because she's a woman. And the same way in this, at first he's contemptuous of Chico Gonzalez, and then he gains some respect for him because you know we don't see a lot of him participating in that shootout at the the um, uh, the, the, the the big cross on the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
he does prove himself. He doesn't get much screen time to do it, but he does prove himself. And so he's willing to accept him, but then uh, his wife isn't going to let him do it. You know, so she's the mealy mouth, little afraid that, you know what, but, but he says he understands that. And I'm thinking, yeah, I understand that too, but we do have to throw that in, but he does accept Chico eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the magic of movies requires us to suspend disbelief from time to time. Here's two things that I do not believe at all. Harry Callahan was shot in the leg and poor Scorpio had a knife embedded into his thigh. There is no way either of those men, especially Scorpio, was going to be walking around up and down the hills all over San Francisco anywhere. He would have bled to death. He should have not been able to be, shouldn't have been mobile from that. So that that was a little kind of threw me out of it because I just didn't believe he could get up and walk around that much without dying um, or being, you know, truly he, he was limping, but wasn't, wasn't quite enough. Uh, I thought, but you know, a, a minor miss, but you know, lots of, lots of violence. Yeah. I'm, I'm always surprised at how quickly people recover in movies <laughs> from gun wounds or knife wounds or anything. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, scene that whole shootout scene at that mining area i mean that that actually was eastwood's idea because he knew san francisco yes and he thought that would be a great place for that for that fight. yeah um morgan um commented earlier has another comment that she feels that eastwood plays in essence an older version of harry callahan in gran torino and gives the you know the the just the vibe of his comes off of him you know, maybe it's a relative, you know, who knows, uh, you know, sometimes filmmakers make universes collide, uh, uh, you know, in the background in their minds, but I, I see that too, you know, but that's, that's him, that's him, his personality, where the Callahan sort of, be, you know, where's the line between Eastwood and Callahan sometimes? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit fuzzy, you know, from time to time, but yeah, I hadn't thought of that connection, but I absolutely agree, I absolutely see it. And I have to say again, I mean, this film is so well made. You know, Siegel and the whole technical crew were just fabulous. And even in the very dark scene, we spent an awful lot of time in the dark alleys in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm even, you know, squinting, trying to see stuff and increasing the brightness on my screen. And I'm thinking, it's not me. It's because I've got the deluxe DVD. It's, it's not me. This was a good transfer. Um, so it is, it is very, very dark. And I understand why some people were, were upset with that part of it. Um, but it is really, really, I, no scene goes on too long for me. No scene feels like it's, it's too abbreviated. You know, there are entrances and exits to scenes, which sometimes these days, all of a sudden we kind of drop into a scene and I'll be like, okay, hold it. Where did we just come from? What are we doing? Think about how many times there are entrances and exits in these scenes in the film. And it, that just kind of smooths the flow as you move through the movie. Uh, and that bank scene is, is just fabulous. And of course, everybody has to go back and count the shots and say, did he really shoot six times? And you see five, but you hear six. Yeah, I forgot to literally scan through and do the counting this time, knowing what I was looking for. But I did it about five times just to be sure. <laughs> Um, what else can we say about Harry Callahan and, and this play? Oh, um, because time has little meaning the last year or so. Um, I don't remember if we did Shaft this year or last year, but I found that an interesting counterpoint being on the surface, somewhat of a similar character. And if, if, if um, Dirty Harry would have been in New York, it would have been very much the same sort of feel of these rebel uh, you know, he's a detective versus a cop, but the same kind of masculinity uh, that that led these characters forward. Um, yeah, I think just think, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but I think it's an interesting counterpoint uh, of, a, you know, a, a black man in, 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 in almost the same role uh, as, as, as Eastwood did. But that was the way cops were portrayed. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Serpico, you know, on and on and on. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to the frontier hero. I mean, it is it is a 
a theme that a trope, if you will, that, that runs through our idea about the independent, individualistic, make your own decisions, set things right, take, take action, take things into your own hands. And he just pushes it to the edge. He just, he just pushes it too far. One thing I still keep, um, I'm still wrestling with is religion in this. There's, there are so many times there are references to religion and like I say, when they shoot up the neon Jesus save sign, I mean, I'm kind of laughing saying, well, I guess he doesn't because this is all being shot up. But then in the aquatic park, they meet up, you know, go up to the big uh, cross and he's looking up at it and it's just towering over them. They're looking down St. Saint, Saint Peter and Paul Church is mentioned a couple of times. He wants to shoot a priest. Um, there, there's a real curiosity to me about how often religion is referenced well you know he feels that he's above everything you know papal like uh, as i mean you know, pope gallon as i mentioned earlier i i read it as <clears throat> he you know he is that level of you know making life decisions lording over people yep. so you know <clears throat> that he, he became a moral i.e religious choice for him to to take on you know the court and the law his superiors uh this guy you know he he got an almost jesus-like power you know in, in his mind um <clears throat> that that they couldn't you know couldn't save the the criminal it was only harry that could do the saving he gave him a christ-like persona um, yeah. yeah i do find it interesting that they begin with the badge and dedicating it to the police officers who gave their lives in the line of duty. I mean, that also gives it in the introduction um, a very serious commentary, a very serious context. It's, it's almost like it was rubber stamped by the, by the boys in blue. Uh, yeah. It gave it, you know, an officialness that gave permission for people to buy into this, that he, a good man it's a good just man uh, he accomplished justice but he's not a good man yeah not even close um he's a you know kind of a terrible person um that accomplishes good things but you know by by what means and, and at what point you know who was the worst psychopath uh, it, it's hard to tell it's really hard to tell who <clears throat> I always get fuzzy on the difference between sociopath versus psychopath. You know, Callahan was almost worse because he was functional. Uh, Scorpio was literally doing, you know, these bad things, but he had a, you know, Callahan had a badge and a gun and permission to do so. And no one was stopping him ever. Of all, you know, they kept re saying, well, you can't do bad things like you did that other time. Well, how many other times were there? And how many times he's just like, ah, I'm going to do what I do. Sue me or walk away. And he keep, they keep paying him to do it. And then, you know, four more films later, they kept paying him to do it. Um, so it was, you know, the rubber stamp permission. The cops let him do it. Well, even the boss says, you know, well, he has a point after he talks about, you know, shooting the guy who's going to, who's chasing the nude woman. He goes, well, he has a point when he says, you know, don't do what you did in the Fillmore district again. Um, you know, well, he has a point as he as he walks out. So there is some permission. But you're absolutely right. I mean, Scorpio clearly is crazy. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. he's a psych and Harry is calm and in control in doing this stuff. Though he does, yeah, that's more lector like uh -huh. um, than than you know the truly crazy criminal. Um, so so there. Um, I don't. I think we may have run out of comments and questions for the moment. Unless anything kind of wanders in uh, to the end. Do you have any other closing thoughts to talk about uh, briefly before we let everyone go off into the electronic mist? <laughs> into the ethernet sphere? Um, no, just I think that this really is a powerful, iconic movie that had a lot of, had a lot of impact. And I think it is important to consider seriously um, what these films say, what all films say, and and stand for. As I say, I, just, I, I so often, of course, with my obsession with film, that people would say, well, you're taking it too seriously. It's just a movie. 
And as I said, when, when you can explicitly measure the impact, I mean, wasn't it Reese's Pieces after ET that yes. sales? And I mean, there's so many of those, of those equivalencies, so many of those stories of the impact of what a film has done. And, and vocabulary. In this, case, in this case, it was a sudden impact, can we say? Ah. <laughs> good one. <laughs> I was working on that. That's a good one. Um, well, and, and sales of Magnums went up after this. And I mean, the, I guess my, my wanting to take this film on, a few people said to me, you know, I can't believe you're talking about Dirty Harry. I said, it's an important movie. Um, and we do need to take seriously and think about what the values and attitudes are. And sometimes they are very much of their time period. And sometimes you see a thread that continues through decades. In and, you know, the, the endless world that he's created, you know, he's got his own Mandela effect going on where people don't, didn't really know where to place Make My Day, which was three films later. Yeah. Um, it just became part of Dirty Harry World, like he's always said. Yeah. And then the other thing, the vocabulary, the, the lines that we pick up. And as I say, this one, and I didn't realize that until, again, going back this time and looking at it and analyzing it, researching, that, that is so often misquoted, you know, that he says, well, you have to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? And people usually misquote it as, do you feel lucky? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a minor little point, but it's it's interesting that people have picked up. The most important thing is they've picked up the line. You know, do you feel lucky? You know, do I feel lucky? Do you punk? And then the make my day and, you know, the vocabulary also becomes part of our culture. And we say those lines and, you know, we act those roles. Oh, I'm going to be really tough, like Dirty Harry, you know, like. And, you know, then you also think of of some of the of the more violent films, vigilante films, you know, where, I mean, he is a vigilante, even though he's supposed to be a cop, which is why David Kerr and Dave Kerr and other people have said there's a real equivalency between him and Scorpio. Yeah. Um, but you think of some of those other vigilante films and it's, you know, it gets, it gets pretty scary. So, you know, overall, I have to look back through our entire list, but it seems like violence is an important theme uh, in crime to a lot of these big hit films uh, from from this year. We'll be talking about Clute. Uh, yeah. And then in two months when we talk about uh, talk about uh, uh, Harold and Maud, well, that talk, you know, that's a different look at violence and nonviolence and perspective, you know, from the perspective of the characters and the, the hilarious, you know, scene with the uncle. Uh, kill, kill, kill. So, that, you know, it's also... <clears throat> the lack of violence and just talking about it and that you know drives the both of the characters there and, and um well i think we're about you know running a bit low on time but um um human film scholar and lovely person tina louise reed um wanted to say thank you very much for a thoughtful look at such a brilliant yet problematic film um diane so it is all those things in it you know really deserve to be on this list very much so as you know problem as it is and you know the the lens was different in 1971 and in 1981 1991 you know we're looking at this film differently for maybe to this degree so not the first time but i certainly see it very different than i would have earlier in my life i yeah. think absolutely absolutely which is good to get perspective on these and perhaps harder to get perspective on the ones that we're watching right now yes Yes. Well, Diane, thank you for taking time out of your life to um, <clears throat> prepare the prepare, you know, your notes and the, looking for clips and rewatching the film and and just, you know, making this uh, a one eleventh of our very special golden anniversaries, 1971. Um, well, thank you all for you... It, was, it was a great project to go back and look at this and think about it. Good. Uh, well, um, like I mentioned, next month will be Clute. Um, in uh, October will be Harold and Maude, and then Fata Morgana will be our 2021 closer in the month of December after a, we hope and pray still that it will be a live and in-person St. Louis Film Festival. Uh, we think so, but we don't know for sure just yet. So with that, yeah, but 
at least we have this. At yeah. least we have Paris, right? That's right. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of movies, yep. we'll have Paris, yep. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Diane. And thank you, everyone, to our viewers. Um, please spread the word. Uh, this will, I mentioned, will be available for streaming on our Cinema St. Louis Golden Anniversaries YouTube channel in perpetuity uh, until the end of time. Okay. Thank you very much and good night.